Hello and welcome to Building the Premier Accounting Firm. This is Roger Connect, President of Universal Accounting, and I'm your host. This podcast is dedicated to helping individuals start and build the Premier Accounting Firm in their areas, helping them address the things that need to be addressed, such as pricing, strategies related to onboarding, retaining clients, and offering quality accounting services to get you paid what you're worth. Each and every week, I have guests on the show to help highlight things that you can be working on in your business to ensure that you're, in fact, building the Premier Accounting Firm in your area. And today is going to be no exception. I happen to have Joe Woodard on this show. He is an author, consultant, business coach, and national speaker. Joe has trained over 125,000 accounting and business professionals in areas of practice development, changing technology trends, strategic consulting, and how to maximize their use of accounting software in their practices. Joe is the host of Woodard Institute, Woodard Alliance, and one of the world's leading training conferences for small business advisors called Scaling New Heights. In 2012 and 2014 through 2020, Joe has been recognized as Accounting Today as one of the top 100 influential people within the accounting profession. Joe regularly publishes articles for Intuit Publications and for Insightful Accountant. And Joe has been featured repeatedly in Accounting Today and Accounting Web in both articles and in video interviews. Joe is the CEO of Woodard Events, LLC, which provides education, coaching, resources, and a community for small business advisors and small business owners within the accounting industry. Joe, welcome to the show. It's great to be here, Roger. This is going to be a lot of fun. You know, I think a lot of what we're both doing is literally helping the accounting professional excel and really revolutionize the accounting profession to help them make a difference with the clients that we're servicing. So I really want to jump into this and get some advice from you because I know you've been doing this for years. So my my first question is, I know that you actually have what you've referred to as six disciplines for advisory services. And to kind of set this up, I'd like to just start with, as an accounting professional, what is advisory services? Yeah, well, that's a broad term, right? It means a lot of things to a lot of different people. It depends on who you talk to. For some CPA practices, the word advisor, in, when inserted between client and services, you know, a client advisory services can just simply mean bookkeeping or bookkeeping with a little bit of an analytical layer. Um, we mean something much more significant when we use that word. What we mean is uh, the advisor is an agent of small business transformation, or to even put it more directly, the, 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 the plumb line for are you an advisor is have you increased your client's wealth? Very good. Now, that wealth could be financial. It could be systematic. It could be infrastructural, uh, procedural, cultural, psychological. Yeah. But of course, at the end of the day, the best way to price is off of a value increase in financial as well. But if we can be not just the recorders of financial information, but the movers of financial position and performance, we've now become my definition of an advisor. You know, I like how you describe that because so many accountants, let's, let's say a bookkeeper, tax preparer, even accountant, find themselves initially just providing the financial reports and doing perhaps the recording of transactions to the extent of giving the client information. But going to that advisory level is really getting either the confidence or perhaps even the competence to now deliver much more useful information for the client to utilize as they're making informed business decisions. And as you were saying, increasing their bottom line, their net worth, or perhaps implementing strategies or procedures to improve the time management of what they're doing in the company. So lots of wins there, but to become an advisor, there's there's definitely things an accountant can do to increase their confidence and their competence in delivering that service. So what are these six disciplines of advisory that you're referring to? Yeah, well, I'm gonna start with the obvious one and that's, that's financial advisory, but I wanna make sure that I'm clear here. A lot of people steer clear of the entire advisory segment, especially if they're not CPAs, if they're enrolled agents or they're bookkeepers, even the CPAs sometimes, because they think financial advisory is the equivalent of fractional CFO services, chief Good financial point. officer services. And since they don't have that corporate background in that, because they don't have a fractional CFO practice, they don't have an MBA, um, they would have some pretty serious and maybe even justified imposter syndrome if they tried to call themselves a fractional CFO. But the, 
But what I'm purporting is not fractional CFO. If your client needs that, go find a really good one um, But and, and partner with them. What I'm talking about, and I really want the bookkeepers to hear me on this, it, for bookkeepers, for you, it's so reachable. If you can, If you can help your client to reduce unnecessary spend by eliminating products that they subscribe to or that they buy on a regular basis that they don't really need, identifying places where they can save money on what they're already buying, ways they can curb costs, maybe they, ways they can avoid double expenditures through better processes. You're right in your wheelhouse as a bookkeeper. Maybe even just help them to not only create, but adhere to a budget. And you have increased their wealth. You've increased the bottom line by helping them to curb costs and expenses. But, but anybody listening to this, Roger, anyone listening to this podcast can do analytics with financial information because the fruit has been lowered on the tree through powerful technology solutions. Uh, a wide range of them, just to name a couple off the top of my head, are like Drav, Reach Reporting, QVinci. They integrate with multiple general ledger systems and they build these beautiful dashboards. And with minimal training, you can learn how to speak intelligently to the tiles on this dashboard. And listen, Roger, you know this, the business owner doesn't care about 15 or 20 or 30 pieces of information. They're not gonna sit down for four hours and listen to a lecture on where they are with financial position and performance. It's just your goal, bookkeeper and accountant, to find the two or three most critical things that they need to know, like you're gonna run out of cash in eight weeks or your accounts receivable, bad debt expenses out of control, whatever it may be that you can help them then act upon. And if that feels reachable to you, you can, you can do that first discipline. You know, you're describing it in a way that I think a lot of the accounting professionals can at least understand because my experience has been the accountant, bookkeeper, even the tax preparer, what they find is after years of experience, there comes this epiphany of, I'm seeing trends, I'm noticing things with my clients that I need to bring up, or if I just ask the right questions, I think we could have a good d dialogue about this and address things that need attention. And what's happening is the perspective that the, that the accountant has is so different than the owner who's involved with the business on such a day-to-day -day basis, they're just not observing what the numbers are revealing. And so as you're pointing out, with some of these tools and technology, we're able to actually draw attention to what needs attention. And now all of a sudden give prominence to maybe two or three things that are actionable, that really could net on the bottom line some, some positive results. And it's up to us as accounting professionals to not just provide that financial information and walk away. It's now taking that time to step more into an advisory role or perhaps even a coaching role asking the right questions and helping them identify what can be done to work on the business. So I'm liking how you're describing all of this. So these six disciplines, um, you, you've got a list of them. Yes, I, that was just the first one, right? Yeah. Let me get to the second one. Um, the technology advisor. Now, I want to make sure I'm clear on this one, too. Just like a financial advisor is not a fractional CFO, a technology advisor is not a fractional CTO or CIO. They're not even a fractional director of information technology because if I were to purport that the people listening to this podcast need to become that, they would. They might just switch to a different podcast right now, Roger. I mean, that's not what we do, right? Mm -hmm. You got to watch a lot of Star Trek and Battlestar Galactica <laughs> if you're going to qualify for that role. So what I'm talking about here is running a checklist. Every bookkeeper and accountant knows how to run a checklist. The technology advisor runs a checklist to determine if the client is modern, if the client is secure, and if the client's technology is operating at peak performance. They may not even fully understand all the implications of the element that they're analyzing, but just like a nurse can take the stats without doing surgery, an accountant and bookkeeper can take the stats of the patient without fully understanding all the biology and all of the surgical uh, disciplines in order to treat them like a physician. And just as with financial, you're going to partner with a fractional CFO. The technology advisor should partner with an actual IT company, but anyone can go in and run the checklist. And from the checklist, Roger, they create a plan. And the right checklist, checklist like we provide at Woodard, 
not only tell you what to look for and the high level implications of what you see there, but it also tells you how to prioritize what you find based on what you saw so that now you can come back to the client and create an entire technology plan to get you from where you are to where you need to be, you need to, and then lay it out in 10, 15, 20 actions, all in sequence, all in priority order. The right checklist like our tools will let you do that. Then it becomes a game of orchestration. You work the project, you white glove the process, you do change leadership, and you help the client to locate and vet the proper resources. Then you orchestrate those resources, whether it's an IT company, uh, somebody that's managing Microsoft 365 or Google Suite, somebody that can even help them make the choice between the two, right? But you're the one that's their advisor you're not their consultant. And that's a very important distinction. The advisor orchestrates the consultants, but that's discipline number two. You know, I like the word orchestrates because I'm imagining this orchestra of different parts. The, you've got the, the different uh, pieces that are making up that orchestra. And in order for this to all work and sound as it should, you've got to be that person as the accounting professional to make sure all of these data sources are coming in, that they're communicating. And as you clearly said, they need to be secure. They need to be functional. The dating needs to be reliable. And what we're doing is we're collecting all this information. And in many ways, the business owner is asking us to be the, the conductor of this orchestra to step in perhaps in some capacity there simply because so many of the things that we're pulling data from are these different tools and technologies that are being implemented either at our suggestion or that they're using in their business to run the company, but it's from these different places that we're getting the data we need to prepare the financial reports and have confidence in the numbers that we're producing. So excellent explanation of the technology and our role with that. So what's the third? Well, the third one is management advisory. Now this one can also seem scary they all seem scary, but when they're just broken down to a process, you take all of the fear and the uncertainty and the doubt out of it. Just as with the other two disciplines, the financial advisor has a simple dashboard tool, the technology advisor has a checklist. Well, the management advisor has assessments. And these assessments are not proprietary to the to water. The ones we use mostly come from the library of Patrick Lencioni. And if you're a business owner and you have employees and you're listening today and you're not a student of Patrick Lencioni, that may be the biggest takeaway from this entire podcast. Go buy every book he's ever written. Start with the book, Five Dysfunctions of a Team, then go to the book, The Advantage, and then go to the book, The Ideal Team Player, and then just start picking from there. Um, and you will become a better leader, you will become a better manager, you'll become a better business owner, but you will also, just by reading these books, you will become equipped to convey that same knowledge and to conduct those Patrick Lencioni assessments that are in all of those books with your clients. You don't have to even pay for a certification. He doesn't even care. He's all about just disseminating the knowledge. Um, just go in and make the changes in the client's organization, maybe give credit to the books that you've read, but you can assess their team performance with one of his tests. You can, uh, uh, each individual team player can be assessed for the way that they are ideal or not ideal or where the gaps are. Um, there are assessments to determine what the, or processes to determine what the company's values are and an entire st- entire methodology for, for laying out those values and determining those. Then the one thing he doesn't cover though, is how to build a chart of roles and responsibilities. So we've taken some of what he's done, some of what Maxwell's done, uh, some of what Jim Collins has done and several other authors, Les McEwen. We've aggregated all of these down into a management advisory toolkit that includes how to build an org chart, how to walk your client through vision, mission, and purpose so they can do like Simon Sinek says and start with why. Mm -hmm. And if all of this seems like a little bit of a foreign world, like like you're Dorothy and I just landed you right into Oz and there's all this weird uh, flora around you, I get it that this may not be the world that you've invested in yet. You're a really good accountant, you're a really good bookkeeper, but you haven't honed your own leadership skills. First, I would say it's a science, it is not a rocket science. 
It's <laughs> incredibly easy to absorb and it's incredibly easy to convey to your client. And talk about, Roger, a radical difference we can make in our clients' offices if we're just well-read and if we go through the toolkit like the one we offer and follow the process like we describe, um, their teams will perform more efficiently, their culture will be stronger, psychologically the business owner will be healthier, they can get more done with fewer people and everybody will feel empowered in the whole organization. And right now with the current staffing crisis that the world is going through, especially the United States, a culture that's compelling is essential to recruiting and retaining team members. So very good point. High impact management is the outcome of the management advisor. You know, one of the things that really stands out when I hear the word advisor is when I hear the word is the idea of being able to educate and help influence. And as advisor, we're supposed to be taking on that capacity with our clients to help introduce to them new concepts, new principles that can be implemented in business. And what you're addressing here are principles that are not just useful for the client, but also our own businesses. These are things that we can be putting into practice, honing, and at the same time, kind of getting experience with as we then introduce them to our clients as best practices. And so what you're describing here are just basic business principles that we should be aware of for our own companies. And then as advisors, take to the clients that we're working with in that advisor role. So that's that's very well said. So what's the next point? All right, operational advisory. Now, just as with technology advisory, you do not have to be an outsourced COO. You don't have to have an MBA. You just have to have a keen eye. And once again, you have to have a checklist. Now, in this case, the checklists must be typical. So there's some generic items, but to some degree, they are industry specific. So you need to, if you're gonna get into operational advisory, you don't have to, but I strongly recommend that you pick an industry. For example, at Woodard Consulting Group, we specialize in wholesale distribution and manufacturing. I've been doing that, Roger, for about 25 years, and I've put in the inventory management systems for companies like Elf on the Shelf and The Big Green Egg. And a lot of other companies are actually even more complex and larger than those, but you've never heard of them. So when we when we put these in, I can walk now into a, an, an, a warehouse and I can instantly find levers that I can pull. What's mm -hmm. their pick routing? Um, what's their shelf capacity and bin capacity, shelf life, um, obsolescence, waste? Um, uh, how are they? How are they dealing with vertical height? Are they are maximizing vertical height? Maybe opening up a second warehouse when they could have just used a little bit more of the one they have and they didn't think to go up. Yeah. Um, are they caging sensitive inventory? Are they dealing with work orders to move inventory within the uh, uh, the environment for manufacturing processes? And I could probably rattle off about twenty other things over about ten more minutes, but I think your listeners get the point. I have extreme industry specific knowledge. You plop me into a veterinarian's office. I can only provide the most general of operational efficiencies. I, I'm, I'm not nearly as valuable there. So if you want to be an advisor, but you don't want a niche, you might want to stick with financial technology and management because you can do those horizontally. If you want to do operational advisory, find the thing you love, find the thing you already know well, lean into that by researching benchmarks, researching data points, Research, researching statistics. And when I tell the operational advisor folks, attend as many conferences for your industry you service as you do for accounting and bookkeeping. And where they're going to all the other stuff, like how to do the latest surgical knives to sur do surgery on dogs, you go to the ones that they're ignoring, like how to better manage a, a veterinarian practice, right? Because yeah. they're all they're going to do at those shows is lean into their trade. That's what we do. That's the inclination. So find the little small breakout rooms everybody else is ignoring, and that's your gold. And they're always at the good shows. And they're going to give you a wealth of data you can use to advise the client. So that's operational advisory. You know, with this, I'm definitely going to come back to the the conference topic. I want to come back to that after we do deal with the sixth item. But regarding this operational, I couldn't agree with you more. Once you become familiar with certain industries and are able to actually offer some expertise in those fields, you become indexp uh, indispensable for that client. All of a sudden, you actually have 
and expertise that they can leverage and lean on as they're running their business to become more competitive in their own marketplace. And so it's a lot of fun. If you actually, with your niching, find passions that you actually have as interests related to even hobbies and and personal uh, interests, it even becomes that much more exciting. So I encourage, like you were explaining, go feel free to go deep and actually learn more than just the accounting associated with the business, but the processes, the systems that are actually in place within the, these professions and, and uh, see what you can do to actually bring your perspective as an accounting pers- uh, professional to those talking points. Because I'll guarantee you that just like perspective can help in all areas of life, you're going to be able to come in and draw attention to point out and see things that the business owner or maybe other industry experts haven't seen because of the perspective you have as the accounting professional. Well, and can I drive one home that make a lot of sense to people? Oh, please. Everybody understands the the direct connection between inventory and cost of goods sold that's listening today, right? Yeah. But do we know how operationally to change cost of goods sold for the better? Because remember what I said, the bookkeeper and accountant they record what's happening with financial in per- performance and position. The advisor changes what's happening with financial position and performance. So if you understand the relationship between shelf life and cost of goods sold, um, then you can change cost of goods sold. If you understand the connection between supply chain management and cost of goods sold, you can change cost of goods sold. Um, so just in time inventory, third party logistics and cost of goods sold, you can change cost of goods sold. Now, if inventory management's not your stick, that's great. My point is whatever niche you pick, you are a typically a big mover in the cost of production line item. That's where the operational advisor lives. And that'll help to make it relevant for the folks here who want a general ledger perspective, a, a general ledger tether point for that discipline of advisory. Perfect. Excellent example. Thank you for that. Let's now go to the sixth item. Yeah. So... Now, we're still staying a little bit away from the accounting side, but a little bit closer to home, and that's knowledge advisory. Now, this one bears a lot of explanation. The other ones, at least we understood the nature of the topic, but but what do we mean by knowledge? Um, Just as the technology advisor deals with information, the knowledge advisor deals with information, the difference. A technology advisor categorizes and stores information in ways that are safe and acceptable and modern. Dropbox, Google Drive, Microsoft SharePoint, Microsoft OneDrive, whatever it is that's serving out the company's files, the the technology advisor has advised them to the right product. But knowledge and information are not the same. You can't have knowledge without information, but they are not synonymous. Knowledge is information in context. So you must bring to their information repositories a context. How are we using this information in the best service of the client? Where does this information fold into the processes of the company? In what ways must this information be cataloged, indexed, and searchable in order to make it discoverable as I'm trying to do whatever I'm doing for my customer or client? So the knowledge advisor works within containers that could be as simple as Evernote or OneNote. That's a contextualization of information. Mm -hmm. But there are very sophisticated knowledge management solutions like Bloomfire that will categorize information into knowledge bases and into customer service snippets and to other kinds of usable contextual pieces. So basically what we're talking about here, Roger, with knowledge with, with knowledge advisory, we're talking about knowledge or intellectual capital democratization. How do I take what is in the collective brain of the organization and capitalize and disseminate it in a way that it's accessible to everyone in the organization. Whatever it is that feeds that out, again, something as simple as Microsoft OneNote or Evernote will accomplish that goal. Now, this is beyond the scope of your question, but I just have to say it because it's so much fun because there's a third step above knowledge. Okay. Knowledge is information in context. Wisdom is knowledge applied through experience. 
So if you have information and you have knowledge, you strengthen the company's wisdom as well. But that's ultimately subjected to the fact that they either need to listen to your experience advisor or they need to be a an experienced business owner or both. But at least you've got the Lego blocks to put together so the business can o- operate wisely. You know, I really like that when you're sharing it, it reminds me of Deming's Wisdom Pyramid. Mm-hmm. What Deming shares is that first you begin with data. And so often in an organization, the data itself isn't even captured. But when we have data, just data alone isn't enough. What we do as accounting professionals, especially with transactions, is we take that data and we start to gather it into information, which would be the reports and so forth. Well, as we're looking at the reports, we're gathering that information and we're compartmentalizing it. We're saying this data organized tells us this information. And from that information, we can sometimes end up with our dashboarding or key metrics that we're watching. But if no one looks at the information, if no one's pulling out the reports and analyzing them or understanding them, we don't go to the next level, which is knowledge. Knowledge is basically the understanding of the application of that information. But just as you explained, wisdom then through experience is that last level. It's basically taking the knowledge that we have applying it and through experience, getting that sixth sense in running the business. So you go from data to information to knowledge, then to wisdom. And so what you're describing is hugely important because the accounting professional is part of that journey. We're the integral part of it. We're finding the data, we're organizing the data, we're communicating the data, hopefully in a way that it's understandable so that the client can now make informed business decisions. And then we're complementing them as they're getting the experience as they're running their business to have the wisdom to pivot as they need to, to remain competitive. So I liked how you were sharing that because that is such an element of being a good advisor. So thank you for that. Well, thank you, Roger. And I'm going to drive this home like I did with the connection between operational advisory and cost of goods sold. Um, I'm going to drive it home in a way that anybody who understands the financial statement can get. Um, A balance in a current asset account or collective balance in all current asset accounts is information. A balance in current liabilities, information. A current ratio is knowledge. Using the current ratio to steer the company is wisdom. Excellent. Now, if you can take what I just said, which everybody here got instantly, right? And say, what if it's non-financial data? Might I be able to put the pieces together in the same way? Absolutely, you can. Just contextualize the data, make it interpretable. It may not be a ratio. It may be some other way to interpret the data point that's non-financial and act upon it. Coach the business to make that data actionable and you become a knowledge advisory. Yeah, what we're doing is we're basically putting spotlights on things that need attention. We're seeing trends. We're seeing things that maybe the business owner isn't noticing because they're too caught up in the day-to-day operations of the business. And you're basically helping them work on things that can make a difference, especially to the bottom line. So this is a good summation of six things that can obviously help us move more into the advisory level services. Well, and I've got one more. We had lost count. I've got the last one. Oh, oh and, let's do one more. <laughs> and I know because we've had a long conversation here. So the last one is succession advisory. Um, and here we kind of bring it back around because everybody's going, oh, well, at least business valuation is part of the profession. You know, if you're a CPA and you're a certified business evaluator. Um, but that's not what I'm talking about. If you if you are that, that's great. That's the people that the people I'm talking to will partner with. That's like a fractional CFO. Mm-hmm. You don't have to be a certified business valuator in order to do what I'm talking about. It, it, with the right piece of software, in this case, the software is called Mouse, M-A-U-S. Just go Google that, M-A-U-S. If you put Mouse, if you attach Mouse to QuickBooks or Zero, or you import it from whatever general ledger solution they're using, Mouse will give you a an estimate of the fair market value, what that business would sell for. And, and, and Roger, it's comprehensive. It looks at financial position performance. It looks at assets, but, but it also looks at intellectual capital, process, scalability, trends of growth or trends of decline. And, and, it's, and it's designed by one of the greatest minds in this field, in literally in the world. His name is Peter Hickey. And he is he he's, he wrote the book on the the one page exit plan, um, and he is a career exit strategist. 
Well, all of his knowledge, talk about knowledge capitalization and democratization. He's, he's taken the knowledge of his some 40 years of experience and, and, and capitalized it into this product so that you can have a report that comes out that says, well, per, per Peter Hickey, the brain of Peter Hickey and a piece of software, the, we believe this company would sell at X. But then it also walks you through exactly what you can do to make that valuation go up. It gives you an, a plan and it asks you how long you want to work the plan, 12, 18, 24, 36 months. The more time you give the plan, the thicker the plan goes so that when you guide the client through the plan, you've increased the client's valuation. And that may be of all the topics that we've talked about today, it may be the one that generates the greatest degree of client wealth because we're talking about a multiple here. The multiple is not too great with accountants and bookkeepers. Right now we're, we're, we're one X revenues, but in some of the industries that the listeners here service, they could be at a five or 10 X multiple of revenue or EBITDA, depending on which way it's measured. Mm -hmm. And if you can drive not just EBITDA increases, but the other forms of assets like intellectual capital process, culture, client retention, customer retention, excuse me, um, employee retention, all of those other measurements that people look at when they're buying or investing, um, you can, you might be able to increase your client's wealth, wealth to the tune of millions of dollars. Now, and, and I know that sounds like rocket science it kind of is in this case. It's a very complex science, but I want to drive home that the science has now been democratized into a piece of software that your listeners may not have known was out there. And it is that piece of software that makes it where everybody listening to this podcast is capable of, of increasing the valuation of their clients' businesses. Now, when it comes to actual exit, they don't want to do that by themselves. We're back to partner with somebody. And I would recommend going out to the Institute of Advisors, which Peter Hickey runs, finding a, an expert in your local area. It's a global organization uh, and Peter's vetted all those people. And then they will actually work your client through the exit. They know brokers, agents, banking relationships, lawyers. It's going to take a whole team. Uh, but, but by the time that your client gets to that team, they're now much more valuable, maybe even millions of dollars more valuable. You know, I couldn't agree with you more. As an accounting professional, we have an opportunity to do so much to impact the worth, the net value of that asset, the business. And really, when you get to that end stage where you're working with a broker and m and &E specialist and you're dealing with basically the transaction of selling the business, there's so much that should have gone on beforehand that could have impacted the valuation of the company. And the accountant over the, the preceding years can really play a significant role, especially in this advisor capacity to influence those various things that really make up the worth of the company. And so if you're actually stepping beyond the accounting role and really trying to help the business understand what determines the value of their business and how it can be influenced in the coming months and years to actually remove risk and increase that valuation, imagine the role you're playing in that, in that relationship. Imagine the gratitude they have where you've actually helped address the one thing they've been working years to build, which is the valuation of their business, it's an asset. And obviously, many will turn to the accounting professional and say, hey, what is my company worth? And it'd be good to be able to at least come with some answer. There are different ways to value a business. And when it gets to the point of selling, working with a broker and such, you can get into the particulars of that. But at least to have a thumbnail assessment and be able to work on what it can be, what can be done to increase that is huge. So I'm glad that that's been brought up today in the advisory role, because ultimately that's what the client wants to see. What is this company that I'm building and working on, putting sweat equity into, perhaps reinvesting in time and time again, actually worth for my exit strategy. So well said on that point. Um, now, these six things are meant, I'm sure, to do as I would say, give the accountant both the confidence and the competence to go out and offer advisory services and fulfill on that, getting paid significantly more than what they're getting paid to provide also the bookkeeping and accounting and tax services. What more would you add as a kind of a capstone to this whole discussion about this uh, advisory work and the six disciplines to achieve it? Well, you just hit one of them, and that's breaking past the price barriers, right? Right right now, if you're doing bookkeeping or tax returns or assurance services, you are earning money. And you're earning it nobly. It's a noble profession. 
but you're not generating wealth necessarily, right? And in and, and, and my definition of revenue versus wealth, revenue is proportional to effort. And therefore, you can't scale the revenue disproportionately to costs. But if you're generating wealth, then you're generating revenues disproportionately to efforts. Well, there are only a couple of ways to do that. One is by leveraging asset, which I think everybody listening here should do. You can leverage process, you can leverage technology, systems, you know, proprietary knowledge and skill sets in order to be more efficient at bookkeeping and tax, and you should. But the asset that you're leveraging when you're doing this kind of advisory work is knowledge. And knowledge work is conducted disproportionately to effort. I mean, Roger, I could go into a business, like take, for example, the inventory business, kind of coming back to my my niche expertise. Mm -hmm. For me to walk through a warehouse, to assess what's wrong, to assemble a report, to sit down with the owner and tell them the 10 things they need to change in what priority order, even if I walk away at that point, if the business owner acts upon those 10 things, I might have generated six figures or seven figures worth of wealth over a two-year run in one hour. If I stay with the client, giving them a much higher chance of actually accomplishing those things, having the attention, the focus, the determination, the guidance to actually get them done, I might work with the client for a year to generate six or seven figures in wealth. The question is not how long did I work with them, it's to what degree did I work with them. It might be four meetings of one hour every week, I mean, one, one meeting a week, four, four hours in a month. I might work with them 48 hours in a year just to guide them through the plan that I've already written, that's a leveraged asset, that I already know how to do, leveraged asset knowledge, that I have a process for, leveraged asset intellectual capital. I don't have to reinvent all of that. I might take little pieces out, add little pieces in and some caveats, I might spend 50 hours or less across an entire year working with a client to generate six or seven figures of increased wealth for that client. As long as I don't make the mistake of charging by the hour, as long as I charge a percentage under the wealth that I generate, I've now generated wealth because I've made money disproportionately to effort. So let's say that I go into the right, and a lot of this is about picking the right client. You know, clients like Big Green Egg and Elf on the Shelf, right? So if I go into a client, I go, okay, you take change these 10 things over the course of a year, then uh, through cost reduction and also through employee reduction and other kinds of metrics we pull, levers we pull, you're going to generate a million dollars projected in in increased wealth. All I want is 20% of the wealth that I'm generating, and I only want it in year one. You get to enjoy enjoy 100% of the wealth that I have generated in years two, three, four, five. And the larger your business gets and the longer you deploy deploy these techniques, the larger that wealth pool goes. So over the next five years, you might make five or $10 million in increased wealth. I want just a measly 20% of what you make in the first 12 months. Just $200,000, that's it. And you get to keep 800,000 and then 100% after that. Now, that's, your listeners might go, Joe, that's nutcase stuff. $200,000 for 50 hours worth of work. I, maybe, you, maybe you think you're talking to the wrong audience. No, I know what audience I'm talking to. I'm talking to an audience that knows how to generate wealth. All you want is a percentage. And maybe I give an extreme example. Let's put it maybe into a more palatable situation. What if you can generate $100,000 worth of increased wealth for your client? You just want 20,000. You still spent the same 50 hours. Still not a bad return. And it's still what I would consider to be wealth generation. Knowledge work is intensely powerful and very effort light. So one of the things that I think is very important to emphasize here is so often in the accounting profession, especially in the last few years, has been this emphasis on value pricing. And I think you just addressed again what that really looks like and how it is important because there are elements of the accounting work that we do that is commoditized now. But what you're showing there is that we could have such a larger impact on our clients if we just go in with a a little bit different perspective and charge for our services accordingly. Now, one of the things that I would add to what you shared 
is advisory work oftentimes is just as we've been discussing, identifying and showing what can be done, the changes that can be implemented and the impact of what those could result in. What I would add to this talking point is I then use the word coaching to distinguish between advisory going in and showing and and uh, identifying these changes to now actually having a relationship with the client where I'm going to literally hold them accountable. They're paying me to hold them accountable through the implementation of this, asking the right questions, and at the same time, ensuring that things get done because it's one thing to point out that something needs to be taken care of. It's one thing to point out that this change can happen, but as you're uh, suggesting, getting more involved with the client and ensuring that it actually gets implemented it's not the best intentions. It's actually the implementation that matters. And all of a sudden, now we're a year later, and we see the results of what we've done, and you're getting a portion or a piece of that pie. That's what I think can be very um, encouraging for our clients, as well as ourselves. That's what's exciting to us is we're now moving beyond just preparing the financial reports. And I think you've done a great job of illustrating how that's possible. So what I want to do is I want to go back to conference. We brought up conference a little bit ago, and I just want to address this. Just at a, at a high level, why should accounting professionals go to a conference? I mean, you talked about attending, if we were in a niche, our niche industry conferences as much as we go to accounting conferences. But just in general, why go to a conference at all? Some people just don't travel and attend these things. They don't. They don't go to them. And of course, it's close to my heart because I, I, I host one of the leading conferences in the world. So I, 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 I noodle over this often. Uh, let me give you some numbers so I can speak to exactly how big the problem is first. Okay. And then I'll talk to talk about why I think it's not happening. So um, in the United States, there are 500,000, roughly half a million members of the QuickBooks Pro Advisor program. They're not all certified. Um, but it's discoverable knowledge out there that a little more than 100,000 of them, about 100 to 150,000 are certified. So even if we just take that number, 100 to 150,000 certified QuickBooks Pro Advisors, they've put the energy necessary to go through a multi-step process to become certified on a piece of software around which they must, some of their business must, re- re- must revolve. Then QuickBooks hosts a conference mm-hmm. called QuickBooks Connect. Yep. For the past several years, they haven't done it during COVID, but prior to COVID, for several years, if you're a member of the QuickBooks Pro Advisor program and you're certified, you can attend QuickBooks Connect for $99. Now, I know there's still a flight and I know there's still a hotel, but just $99. So you cared enough about this product to certify on it, which probably indicates it either is or you desire for it to be central to the operations of your practice. You've established a professional designation around the product and you identify with it as a practitioner. You can spend $99 and on Frontier or Spirit Airlines, if you want to be really adventurous, probably get to the San Francisco Bay Area for about 300 bucks at the top side. Mm Mm-hmm. You could stay at the Motel 6 by the airport for 50, 60 bucks a night if you wanted to stay adventurous <laughs> or get with your buddies and do a, uh, you know, some sort of uh, VBRO or something like that, Airbnb, and stay super cheap. Um, but you, but, but do you have, do you know the number, Roger, how many accountants go to QuickBooks Connect for $99? I would say south of 10,000. It's 2,000. 2,000 to 2,500, mm-hmm. which means that you're talking about somewhere in the range of 1.5 to 2% of the people that certify on the QuickBooks product go to QuickBooks Connect. This is not just a problem. This is systemic. It's, it's almost universal. Um, I even cast the net wider. I, I'm one of the only general ledger product agnostic shows in the United States. There's ZeroCon, there's QuickBooks Connect, there's Digital CPA, which is basically a Sage Intact show. There are a lot of shows that revolve around uh, a piece of software or a platform, you know, Sweet World for NetSuite and, and so forth. But but there are very few shows that are truly platform agnostic that would grab any advisors from any of those areas. I'm one of those. We have even fewer. Uh, my total available market's closer to 750,000 and we have about 1,200. We're still one of the biggest, though, in the country with 1,200. 
So why? So, so that now that we have the numbers to back it up, let's address your question, which was very solid and it was the right question to ask. Why aren't accountants and bookkeepers going? Well, ob obviously we've collected data on this. It's our job. And I'll tell you the primary reason they say they don't go. They have the money. That's not a problem. They see the value. Up to a point, they get the value. That's not a problem. They, the, the answer is the same answer every single time. I don't have the time. And what they're saying when they say, I don't have the time, it, they're, they're, it's a twofold problem that needs to be addressed. One is a problem of adaptive capacity in your firm and in your life, right? You're overworked, which is symptomatic of the wrong kind of work. There's not enough knowledge work in there. It's also symptomatic of price. If you're overworked, you're probably underpaid. I'm going to say that again, just so your listeners get it if they're driving and maybe somebody distracted them on the road just now, because I want to make sure they get this. I'm going to say it again. If you're overworked, you're probably underpaid because you can solve the overwork problem by just going up on your price. Some percentage of your clients are going to leave and you're probably going to make more money and your overwork problem goes away. I don't mean to oversimplify it, but if you've got too many clients and you still can't pay the bills, take a look at price, but also take a look at the nature of the work that you're doing. Is it knowledge work, which is disproportionately to effort? So, so if capacity is a problem, pull some capacity levers, maybe even just fire 20% of your clients without going up on the price. You probably don't like them anyway, right? They're probably the people you complain about on Twitter. Have you been on Twitter during tax season this year, Roger? Um, that's pretty <laughs> much what it turns into for all the people I follow is complain about the clients. And I'm like, well, just fire them, right? Fire them already. Get your life back. Make the big moves to get your life back. And then the second thing is, when you go to the conference, understand that it is so much more valuable than information. Remember we said information is just the baseline thing. That's the other argument I hear. I can listen to podcasts, I can read books, I can go to free CPE, even we offer free webinars, everybody offers free webinars. And since where we live in the information age, free education is everywhere. Why would I go all the way to Orlando this June to go to a conference? Because information must have context. And it's at conferences that you get context. Information must be applied through experience, and it's at conferences that you meet people with complementary experience to your own. So yes, it's knowledge, but it's also relationships, it's technology exploration, it's taking a pause button on your practice to put yourself into an environment where you're in a position to receive. And I'm even gonna add, if it's the right conference, you may get a healthy do dose of inspiration as well. And I don't know about you, Roger, but after weathering the COVID storm um, on multiple fronts, compliance, my own life and my business, um, I think I'm ready for a little inspiration. There you go. So do you have any tips, like let's say best practices in general for attendees of a, of a, a conference, what they can do to get the most out of the experience? Yeah, I call it the three things approach. Um, what three things are you going to learn that you can take back and do in the next 12 months? You might learn 100 things, write them down. What three are most important and what three simultaneously are actionable in the next 12 months? Then focus on execution. You mentioned that earlier, Roger, that, that that's what the advisor's role is to make sure the execution happens. You didn't use those exact words, but make sure they act upon the plan. Okay, so so... It, it, that's the other thing I hear is I came to the conference, but, you know, I, I got too busy afterwards and I can't do anything with what I learned there. Okay, well, then just come with a plan. Come with a plan to find the three things, three things that are most important and executable. Second, what three people did I meet that will have a profound impact on my life or practice? Just three. You're going to meet 100. Find the three. Lean into those relationships and turn the, greet, the meets and the greets and the handshakes into actual business networking relationships. And the criteria for that will be, do they have, can they coach me and mentor me? Maybe they've already gone through Joe's School of Advisory and they can help me to map the same. Maybe I can mentor them because maybe that relationship's a give back approach. Or maybe that's the fourth one you add every time. Do they have unique and differentiated, <coughs> excuse me, skill sets 
that complement my own so I can partner with them on engagements? Do they have a clientele that's different from my clientele because they have a different niche? So when I run across a construction client who needs operational advisory, I can send it to them. When they hit the wholesale and distribution, they can send it to me, cross refer services. You'll know who those people are and have that lens every time you're meeting somebody to ask the right questions, to determine which ones are going to be most valuable. Find the three, it's only three, and lean in. What are the big three inspirational ideas that affected the way I see myself or even the world? That happens at conferences, especially conferences like mine and conferences that pull in, other conferences that pull in inspirational figures. Uh, a name you might not, your listeners may not know, Inky Johnson. Just go out and watch Inky Johnson YouTube videos and start crying. Just get even, even the men. Go ahead and grab the tissue box and start crying because that man has such an inspirational story. And he's gleaned from the inspirational story of his life, these powerful truths that he gave us. It would be like the difference between information and truth is what I'm referring to. What are the truths? that you've gleaned from these speakers. And if you're going to a conference that doesn't give you the truths, I'm sorry, even if it's mine, find a different conference, find one where you get truth. So it's three people, three pieces of information that I can act upon, that's knowledge, three truths that are gonna impact my life, and I've got one more. What three software products can I incorporate in my practice over the next 12 months that are gonna make a radical difference? If you do all 12 of those, if you lean into all 12 of those, not only will you come back the following year to pick up 12 more, but you're going to see a significant return on your investment. Whatever little measly amount you pay in a flight and hotel, or even if you don't consider that amount to be measly, try to compare that against the value of the 12 things I just mentioned. It can't compare. Your return on investment is extreme. You know, those things that you've just shared are hugely important, and I'm going to add to them, uh, perhaps even complement them. Um, From a best practice point of view, let me just share a few things that are meaningful to me with conferences. The first being this whole idea of doing them virtually, uh, sitting in the office, staying at home, having it on the computer while I'm multitasking is, I think, hugely inappropriate for what it is that you can get from attending a live event. The live event is is crucial. It allows you to step outside of your day-to-day operations, remove yourself from what your environment for working and whatever is, and go into a new environment where you're vulnerable. And you're now going to take and listen to things that are going to allow you to work on your businesses. And as Joe's uh, three items each illustrate is you're going to come away with things that are going to slip through the cracks when you're multitasking and not paying complete attention to what's going on at the conference. The second thing I would point out is we're, we're people that are creatures of, of social necessities. Um, we, we are a social group. And because as people, we may think as accountants that I maybe don't like people, uh, we need to get into the environment of meeting with our peers, finding people that just like us are doing the same thing and glean from those conversations, things that we can take back and implement in our own businesses. There are people at these conferences in the exact same situation as you are, if not ahead of you, that you can learn from. And as Joe was pointing out, come away with some newfound relationships that even next year you can kindle and and over the course of the coming year, uh, basically develop. But the one thing I would also add to this is set aside time after the conference for you to now take what you've learned and implement in your business. I, as a practice, now set aside the day following attending a conference. Now, this isn't the travel day going back. This is the day back in the office, one whole day where I don't let me myself get back into the day-to-day routine, but rather I review my notes. I find these takeaways as you were describing them, and I figure out how I'm going to implement them in my business. And in doing so, I spend that day trying to now Uh, put into practice what it is I was inspired to do just the days before, rather than returning from the conference, getting sucked into the day-to-day routines, and even with the best of intentions, not implementing anything. And so really, it's if it's a two-day conference, then I definitely want to have that time after the event still set aside for the implementation and application of what I've learned. And the one thing I wanted to bring up now happens to be the trade show, because one of your elements was technology and what things you could implement in the business. And I just want to do, if if nothing else, a shout out to the vendors that not only make the conferences possible, 
but they take time to actually come and stand at those booths. And too often I see people try to avoid the vendor area. They try to speed through, maybe grab the little piece of candy that's on the counter. When rea- in reality, they're, if not more inv- or the, as valuable as the presenters, more valuable because there's where the technology is, the cutting edge. This is what's on the horizon. This is what's either going to help you or your clients take your businesses to the next level. And we should be taking time to walk through the vendor area, find out who these players are, what are they bringing to the accounting community and so forth, and seeing what is relevant for us to actually consider in our own business. What would you say about the, the vendor area and the trade the tradesmen that come? Yeah, well, first, I agree with you completely. It's twofold. And I think primarily it's about they're, they're there as a benefit to you. It's that three pieces of technology that I can deploy in my practice or with my mm-hmm. clients. That's, that's huge. It's about just a general awareness level knowledge because you never know when a client is going to approach you and ask you, do you know of a widget or gadget that integrates yes. with QuickBooks or Zero that does X? Yes. Well, you can go back to where you've cataloged that information, contextualize that information. It's called knowledge. And you can search for that. You can find that person you met at a trade show three years ago or whatever. Um, so there's that. Everybody loves being the hero to their client, having that answer. You can get the answers. But then secondarily, but oh so important, is to give back where they gave to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people don't understand how show economics work. They think I make a profit on the attendees and turn around and hand over fist, make a profit on the show floor. And Roger, I know you know the industry better than that. By the time that someone pays to come to my show, all they've done is cover the cost of putting them into the show. Uh, food and beverage, a cup of coffee at, at, a, at a hotel like the Marriott, where we're going to be is somewhere around $8 a cup every time they open up that little spigot and pour it into that little cup. It's about $8 a cup. That's about $65, $70 per every time I fill one of those things. So I'm making no money whatsoever. Uh, are very, very little money on the actual attendees, the registrants covering their cost. The only way that a company like mine can afford to do a show like Scaling New Heights, bring in people like we've had in the past with Steve Forbes and Damon John and others, uh, Inky Johnson, be inspirational speakers, put on main stage productions that are riveting, offer 10 breakout tracks simultaneously and do them at at world-renowned places like the Marriott Uh, World Center in Orlando, the only way I can do that is because those sponsors sponsor that show. They are the entire economic lifeblood of that show. And and, and I'll just kind of drive the point home because this isn't just my show. I think everybody should know this little bit of background knowledge. But in the case of my show, if I didn't have sponsors, I would have to charge $4,000 a seat to give you the same experience. Amen. Instead, I'm charging $7.95. You've said it very well. These events are not cheap. They're not inexpensive. They're worth attending. And honestly, if you go with the right mindset, you can come away with so many things to actually help you work on your business. And I personally think it gets you out of the day-to-day things that you're doing and allow you to actually see your, your true potential just because you're going to be exposed to people that are farther down the path of success than you are and you'll be able to get inspired by that and more importantly, find actionable items to help you move towards that. Um, one last question, uh, actually not one last question, but real quickly a question, Thrive. I know Thrive is a big part of what you're talking about for the accounting profession. What does that word mean to you? Yeah, it's the theme of this year's conference. So I'm so glad you asked, it's close to my heart. We've already talked about some of them. It's wealth disproportionate to effort. It means that you have capacity. We've talked about that one, but it's also that your work life harmonized. Um, it's that you ultimately have a practice that somebody would want to buy one day. These are all components of, of the definition of Thrive. But it also means that the six disciplines of advisory we talked about at the beginning, that you've deployed them so the cobbler's kids are not going barefoot, right? It means that you're making shoes for yourself. You have technology that's modern and secure. You have a succession plan where you're increasing your valuation. You manage your people well and have a strong, positive, invigorating, empowering team culture. You are financially aware of what's going on in your own business. You contextualize information and apply it in the form of wisdom. If you are practicing your own advisory, you are in multiple aspects, not just in the fact that you're an advisor, but the fact that you are your own patient, you are thriving. Well said. 
Here's another question. Freedom. What does freedom mean to you? <laughs> freedom. Freedom means guardrails, which I know sounds like an oxymoron. Um, Chesterton said, when you break the big rules, you don't get freedom. You get the little bitty rules. <laughs> so, um, so freedom, if you want to be truly free, it means that you don't just do anything you want to do without prudency, without consideration of your own past and your own future hopes and dreams. You don't do just anything you want to do without consideration of your own financial constraints or financial guardrails. And you don't do anything you just want to do without an accountability partner in life, some mentor that's providing guidance to you. So, so Roger, true freedom takes place between the guardrails of life. It, it is not the absence of guardrails. You know, I really appreciate you sharing that because for some people, they do confuse freedom to mean anarchy, that it's a place without rules and anyone can do anything. And in reality, that is counterintuitive to what freedom truly is. So I appreciate you sharing that. And you could use this example, listeners, if you wanted to use the guardrails example. If you say the word budget to your small business owner or client, who's probably a hyper optimistic visionary, they're going to think constraint. If you can frame that as these are protective guardrails for you that actually engender freedom, that's what a budget does. It empowers the people within the organization to act without the direct approval on every single purchase of the business owner to be innovative and for the business owner to sleep well at night, even if they've just written a $300,000 check because they know it was, wait for it, on budget. There you so go. The budget is psychologically freeing. It's operationally freeing and it's managerially freeing. It's not a constraint tool. And the same applies to our life. A budget in life, a set of guidelines, a higher principle we follow is simply just a set of guardrails to protect our own journey. Perfect. Thank you for that. You know what I'm going to do here, Joe, is I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going to basically do a summation of our conversation, some of the things that are highlights for me, and then at the same time end by asking you for a closing thought. So before I begin my summary, there are a few things that I'd like to bring to your attention as listeners that you'll find in the episode description of this podcast. And it happens to be some offers that are going to be made available for you to actually take advantage of. So I encourage you to go check these out. The first is, is there's actually a a uh, way to register for Joe's event, Scaling New Heights, as he was describing it. And it's a yearly conference that I would encourage you to attend. I've been there for years, and you'll see me there this coming time. And at the link on the site, he'll be providing a 10% discount for the registration. And so you'll definitely want to take advantage of that and save some money, register and attend. I'll encourage you to say hello to me. I love meeting uh, not only my listeners, but the fans, only because of the fact that this is meant to be a social experience. And I invite you to attend and with me work on our businesses. The other thing I'd like to encourage you to do is find out more about how Joe empowers small business advisors. It's some of the six principles that he was speaking of today. And you can learn more of these things at the information found in the episode description. In addition to that, what I'd like to encourage you to do is also get a copy of the uh, two free books that I'll be making available. It is, first of all, one that every advisor should have as they're working on their business and assisting clients. And it's called In the Black, Nine Principles to Make Your Business Pros Profitable. It literally addresses for you the short-term, mid-term, and long-term things that you need to be doing to ensure that profit is deliberate and intentional, not only in your organization, but also those of your clients. And in that book, we actually address the things that are related to what Joe was sharing earlier, which is Deming's Wisdom Pyramid, that you can learn about data, information, knowledge, and wisdom, and the road that you play as you help your clients move down that. The other that you'll also take advantage of happens to be the book Red to Black in 30 Days. It is a small business accountant's guide to quick turnarounds. It's the how-to guide for you to actually help your clients with the most common challenge that many of them face, which is cash flow management. It's here that you're going to learn about value pricing, as Joe was describing, and how you can actually implement those principles in your business. I'd like to encourage you to go to the episode description and take advantage of those. Now, as a summary of our conversation today, 
Joe did a great job of helping us understand the world of advisory work. So often we're talking about value services or value pricing, and he gave us a pathway to actually achieve that. What we're talking about are things that you can do in your business to ensure that you're going beyond just providing financial reports, but literally stepping into your client's world and helping them do things that can ultimately, as he uh, correctly defined, help with succession planning. It's really, it's an asset. This business owner is working hard to develop it. It's not just generating on a yearly basis profits, but it's becoming something of worth over time that's going to, at some point, need to be separated from the original original business owner. And how you can facilitate that and be a part of that is hugely important if you actually apply these principles that he brought up. So go to the episode description and you'll find some things related to the items he mentioned, such as the mouse software and so forth. Now, as a summary, I'd also like to point out regarding conferences. I agree with Joe. There are a lot of conferences that we can each attend. They all have very various nuances, but there's a sense of community when you attend. There's a wealth of information that you can apply in your business. But ultimately, what it is, is it's a chance for you to step out of your business the things that you're working in day by day, and now work on your company. Get out of your comfort zone, travel somewhere, meet peers, learn from the experts, and go to these conferences with the intent of actually now taking your business to that next level. It's in these conferences that you'll actually be exposed to upcoming trends and technologies, things that you can be the hero, as Joe mentioned, when you go to your clients and say that you have a solution that you can introduce them to that they weren't aware of. Why? Because you attended the conference, you paid attention, and particularly attended the vendor area. So definitely take advantage of those things. And then the last thing I'd like to point out is with freedom. I couldn't agree more. Uh, It's not anarchy. It's where you actually have a life where you've set boundaries and you live with purpose and intent. And it's within those boundaries that you're able to operate freely because you have the comfort of knowing that you're on that right trajectory and I think that's very well said. So I appreciate his comment regarding that. So Joe, what did, what would be your final closing thought for our listeners? Well, and this closing thought may be a summation of everything we've covered all the way up to this point, um, or at least it, it affects everything we've covered up to this point. And that's don't give away your power. Um, now, that would be a life principle as well as a professional principle. But since this is a professional bo- podcast, I'll put it into that context. When we don't demand the price that we're really worth, and and I would even say beyond demand, command the price that we're really worth and draw the proper line in the sand and say, and let the client walk away if they're not willing to pay it, then we have given away our power. When we let the client procrastinate on giving us the source documents we need while still insisting that their tax return be filed on time and we acquiesce, we are giving away our power. When the client invades our personal time, our personal devices, our personal spaces, or treats us in ways that are unprofessional, if there's any kind of professional invasion of a boundary and we tolerate it, even lean into it, then we are giving away our power. It is perfectly fine for you to tell a client no. It is perfectly client fine for you to tell a client yes if. Yes, I will file your return on time if I have everything I need to prepare that return, including accurate financial statements by March 31st, I mean, by February 28th or whatever your cutoff is, I'm happy to file it by March 15th. If after that, I can make no promises. That's a respectable position. It doesn't make you an uncaring accountant. It doesn't make you a jerk. It makes you a powerful accountant. And Ultimately, two things are going to happen that benefit you and benefit everyone you work with. The client is going to respect it and respect you more and stay. The client is not going to respect you and not going to respect it and leave. Either way, you win. Perfect, Joe. Thank you for that. I really think this has been an excellent conversation that for many are going to have uh, good nuggets to take away from this. So thank you for being on the show. Let me just kind of recap or uh, end this rather by encouraging you to, to subscribe to the podcast. This is something that is released each and every week. 
with the intent of helping you become the expert in your business, hearing from the experts as to things that you can actually implement for you to build the premier accounting firm in your area. So listen to the episodes, go back and look at the past episodes, get ready for the new ones that are released each and every week and subscribe to the podcast. As for the information that you've heard here today, if you're interested in learning more about it and various principles that you can apply in your business, feel free to reach out to us. You can visit us at universalaccountingschool.com or you can give us a phone call at 801-265-3777. And always remember this, if it's about accounting, it is universal. Take care, have a great day and be safe out there.